I want to bring in NBC's Yamiche Alcindor, who is in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where the vice president was earlier today. Matthew Dowd was chief strategist for the Bush-Cheney campaign in 2004 and is an MSNBC senior political analyst. Megan Hayes is former special assistant to President Biden and director of message planning. She was deputy communications director for President Biden's 2020 campaign. Great to have all of you here. So look, Matthew, you've got all this money all this information you've collected on all of these voters. How do campaigns combine all of that and put them to work in these final days? Well, they, they have to decide, first, they have that strategic decision that identifying a swing voter or an undecided voter at some point becomes a fool's errand. And I think at this point, it is a fool's errand. And really? I think the vast, yes. I think the vast majority of resources, 95% of resources, in the campaign, my guess is it was in the Bush campaign in 2004, for the next 14 days or 15 days will be spent on motivating voters they know will vote for, for the vice president at this point. I think an undecided voter, if somebody says they're undecided voter today, and we saw this in 2000 and 2004, they're either not gonna vote or they've already decided they're just not telling you. And so I think it's a waste of money and resources at this point to go after undecided voters the better spend is on motivating voters she knows that are already with her. So, Megan, in, the, in that Times report, the political director of the Trump campaign talked about the undecided and said, these people are not super political, and so we're doing non-super political media. And I want to play what Donald Trump said in Pennsylvania about the late golfer, Arnold Palmer. Arnold Palmer was all man, and I say that in all due respect to women, and I love women, but this guy, this guy, this is a guy that was all man. This man was strong and tough, and I refuse to say it, but when he took showers with the other pros, they came out of there, they said, oh, my God. That's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, no matter how many times you um, hear that, it still is a little bit unbelievable itself. But having said that, Megan, and I'm not going to suggest that that is part of the campaign strategy. Arguably, there may be some people on his campaign who wish, it, wish he would not say things like that. Having said that, I wonder if that is the kind of thing that breaks through that might appeal to people who have been voting for Donald Trump or voted for Donald Trump back in 2016 because he is not, to say the least, your typical politician. Yeah, if you look behind him, you see all the men in the back just totally laughing. So I think that that's who he is appealing to, right? He's trying to appeal to his base. He's trying to appeal to men. He's trying to appeal to things on social to social media and people who are getting their news solely on social media. So I do think it's part of a campaign strategy. I think that he likes this sort of um, obnoxious conversation that's shocking to people that's not in the norm of what you think are politicians, so to speak, when they're out um, on the campaign trail this late. And I think that this is trying to get his base out because this is going to be an election about his base turning out. I think when the vice president's trying to build a contrast, not only is she trying to get undecided voters to vote for her, she's trying to give his base a reason to stay home. And so, you know, they're both sort of saying the same thing. She's trying to build the contrast about what's presidential, and he's trying to motivate them to turn out. There is no doubt, Yamish, that uh, certainly the Harris campaign is doing exactly what Matthew said, which is how do we get these folks out there who support us to vote? Today is the last day to register where you are in Pennsylvania. So what's the strategy on the the ground there uh, to get these voters to the polls and and maybe get some of these undecideds to actually register people who maybe were not so engaged were not necessarily planning to vote. Well, Harris campaign officials tell me that the strategy is that they really want to get out the vote and be everywhere at all times. So that's why you have the vice president going to, of course, first Pennsylvania, then she's going to be going to Michigan, then she's going to Wisconsin to really go and talk to voters face to face directly. Um, she just wrapped up this interview or this really moderated conversation with vice president, um, with, with Liz Cheney, the vice president did. And what you saw was really her taking questions from the audience, talking directly about what she sees as the danger and the threat 
of a, a former President Trump being elected. It was interesting because part of what she's doing here is to try to bring people um, who are really running, who, 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 where the message of Republicans is really resonating, the idea that you might not agree with all of her policies, but that you want to back her because you're really seeing her as someone who will defend the Constitution. And I just wrapped up an interview with a voter who, remarkably, someone, you don't really get this that often, a voter who told me he was convinced while he was sitting there to vote for Vice President Harris. He was an African-American man, 42 years old, who said he came here because he had never been to a political Political rally. He watched her. He said that she answered questions very specifically. And as a result, he will now be voting for Vice President Harris. He's a registered independent who had been voting Democrat in the past, but he said this year he was really thinking about the Republicans, especially because of the economy. And he was convinced because of the answers that she gave that he will now be voting for her. So it's those kind of events that the Harris campaign is hoping will do that for all sorts of voters across this country. And when it comes to sort of how are they going to be trying to get people to the polls, they are having an operation, they tell me, that is really dwarfing, they believe, the size of the Trump campaign. So they have all sorts of field offices and staffers, including staffers who worked for former President Obama, um, who are specifically focused on Pennsylvania to make sure people have um, a real plan to vote. So they're really trying to make sure that not only people support her, but then have a specific way that they're going to be getting to the polls, whether that's early voting, whether that's making sure that they have plans with their neighbors and their friends. So it's all sort of this holistic blue, they would say, the Harris campaign would say is the way that they're trying to get out the vote in these last few days with 15 days to go, Chris. Yeah, Michelle Sindor, who found that uh, unicorn, somebody who in the closing weeks of the campaign decided who they were going to vote for because of an event. Thank you very much for that, Yamish. You know, uh, Megan, um, the Harris campaign has very clearly decided Liz Cheney is key to reaching at least some of the voters they need. And apparently, President Biden, at least in tandem with her, is not the campaign. White House officials tell NBC there are no plans to campaign with him in these final 15 days. Do you think that's smart, especially considering Biden's close ties in a state like Pennsylvania? I think it's a strategic decision to get your surrogates to spread out and to fan out across the, all the battleground states. You know, the president's traveling to New Hampshire tomorrow to talk about uh, prescription drugs, the lowering of prescription drug costs, and then he's traveling to Arizona. So I think he is hitting strategic media markets and he but is are, talking. Are you suggesting that this is not a strategic decision for her not to stand with him? I don't necessarily think so. I don't. I mean, I, you haven't seen her stand with Obama either in the last couple of weeks, and I don't think that they're planning on campaigning together or with Michelle Obama. You know, this is an opportunity to hit a lot of media markets. Uh, she is very fortunate, unlike President Trump, to have a lot of people who are backing her and a lot of surrogates out on the trail for her. And I think that that's an important thing to get to cover media markets and to be out there. As everyone knows, local media is where a lot of people and a lot of undecided voters are getting their news and their their nightly news when they're cooking dinner for their family. So it's important to be there. And I think the Democrats showing up for her right now now is what's important. So I don't necessarily think they need to be standing by. Uh, it's, I, I just don't think that that's a necessity at this point. And Matthew, I have to ask you about Donald Trump uh, trolling Kamala Harris with these baseless claims that she never worked at McDonald's. Uh, he put on an apron. He salted the fries um, and, uh, pardon the pun, peppered in the insults. Take a listen. It was a big part of her resume that she worked at McDonald's, how tough a job it was. Uh, she specifically worked at the French fry where they make the French fries, and she talked about the heat. It was so tough. She never worked at McDonald's. McDonald's just confirmed that again, by the way. She never worked at McDonald's. In other words, she's lying Kamala. Um, a Harris spokesperson responded by saying, when Trump feels desperate, all he knows how to do is lie. He can't understand what it's like to have a summer job because he was handed millions on a silver platter only to blow it. On the other hand, there are other people who I've heard say, you know what, it makes him seem more approachable. He was kind of funny in that. What do you think that accomplished, if anything? I think it makes him look like a clown, actually. I mean, I mean, first of all, he lies throughout of it. So I guess he gave a side order of lies in the course of whatever he was serving up. The other uh, thing is it was a complete <laughs> dad joke. Um, I mean, it was a total made up stop. They shut the McDonald's down and then they had supporters practice going through the drive through. So it wasn't even a day that the McDonald's was open for business. So he was in there in this faux sort of shtick that he does. I don't think it was smart of him. I think he should be wanting to talk about the economy and inflation and the border and crime. And here he is 
dressed up in his red tie and white shirt at a McDonald's that was shut down for him on, on for, for him on purpose. And so I actually don't think it's smart. I think it's stupid strategically for him because he should be talking about issues that he has an advantage on not doing this shtick at McDonald's. Megan, I saw you said that McDonald's uh, was a humanizing moment for Trump. It has been trending on Twitter. Do you think it helps him? So I said he threw some salt over his shoulder and because he's superstitious. I that was the humanizing moment. I don't I actually think that going to a, stop, a McDonald's that was closed down is a campaign stunt. I think that the politicians do local stops all of the time and they interact with people who are there uh, who are ordering food, if it's an ice cream shop or a deli or something, and the employees. I think that this is another moment that he is wasting not talking about the issues and not talking about the economy. And I just think that he only did this to jab the vice president and pointing out that she came from a middle class background and understands people who are going through struggles um, in the, in their economic uh, you know outlook right now, I, I think only like humanizes the vice president. So I, you know, I think... <laughs> I think that this stunt was it's successful because it's being played in the media. But again, it's playing to his base, not to the undecided voters who really matter.